A very good evening and warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, we are extremely happy today to have you on the 139th session. Uh, friends, uh, please join me in welcoming a very distinguished leader, Dr. Swaminathan Mani. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan Mani is the Vice President for Business Strategy, Marketing and many things. Uh, here he is. Please join me in welcoming him. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome to this uh, 139th uh, Leadership uh, Conversation. We are delighted to have you. Thank you for the time. And I'll quickly do a brief introduction and hand it over back to you for your opening remarks. Uh, I'll share my screen, sir. So uh, these are wise view sessions. Uh, as I mentioned, we are on number 139. Every Friday, we conduct this at 6.30 p.m. Today, uh, Dr. Swaminathan Mani is going to talk about resilient skills in the VUCA world. This is a very, very relevant topic, and he is an amazing speaker. Mark my words, in the next two, three minutes, I will switch off myself but you will enjoy the session. Uh, this intro and uh, the talk will be for the first half an hour and the Q&A for the next 30 minutes. So that's roughly 60 minutes of time that we have with uh, Dr. Mani. Uh, Dr. Mani is the uh, Vice President Corporate Strategy and Marketing for Tech Mahindra. He has more than three decades of work experience, predominantly in the IT sector. He oversees, uh, his areas of expertise are overseeing technology analysts, guiding large deal advisors, nurturing alliances with partners, and providing comprehensive support in pursuit endeavors. Dr. Mani has earned two distinguished PhDs. These days, doing one PhD itself is difficult, but sir is uh, holding two PhDs, one in management that is in renewable energy from the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun, and the other in psychology from lovely professional university in Punjab. He published several papers in an international peer-reviewed Scopus indexed journals of repute and has been cited over 300 times approximately. He has been awarded over 20 copyrights by the Registrar of Copyrights Government of India. He has been functioning as a reviewer for many international academic journals of leading publishers like Emerald, part of Board of Advisors for Modi University, Board of Studies for NIT Trichy, Jindal Global Business School, and Curriculum Review Board as industry representative for LPU wonderful track record and amazing. And he holds an engineering degree from Brits Pilani and an MBA from NIT Trichy, a master's degree in psychology from University of Madras, master's degree in sociology from IGNO, a diploma in counseling, psychology and guidance from Acharya Nagarjuna University AP, and a PG certificate program in senior management from the prestigious IIM Nagpur. Wonderful, sir. We couldn't have brought a better person. He sounds more academic. There's a greater strategic depth and an academic width uh, for Dr. Mani. And uh, he is an amazing leader. We are we're going to listen to him. Give me just one more minute. I will introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor R. Prasad. Uh, he carries uh, more than three decades of rich experience as an entrepreneur and an academic. Uh, he uh, holds a BTEC from IIT Bombay and a PGDM from IIM Kolkata. Welcome, Professor Prasad, and thank you very much for uh, uh, joining both of you. Without much ado, uh, we will save a lot of time and uh, we'll hear uh, Dr. Mani speaking. Over to you, sir. And once again, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sudhakar. Uh, uh, hello to uh, Professor and to all the participants. I saw about 30 of you on the call. Uh, and and uh, you know originally I was given twenty minutes. I'll try and stick, but it will not exceed thirty minutes uh, because I did the trial run. I was telling uh, Mr. Sudhakar yesterday, and it took longer than thirty minutes. But I'll try and do it. Resilient skills is very important. Uh, you know, as uh, Mr. Sudhakar gave the introduction, <clears throat> especially after 2020. 2020 was a watershed year where people saw significant loss, loss of loved ones, loss of job, loss of multiple things. Uh, and, and they were not really prepared for that kind of a, that kind of a situation. So many people could not even bounce back uh, from the crisis and this was found wanting. So when Mr. Sudhakar asked me that I should speak to you all, then I thought this is a topic that is relevant for the leaders like you on this call. Okay, so uh, be before I start, you know, and cover to cover, I have 20 slides uh, that including thank you slides and the cover slide and I have a couple of slides of book recommendation and this kind of a disclaimer. So if I remove all that, the, the core content will be about 15 slides. And I'll cover in 30 minutes. Okay, so before I start, there is a disclaimer. This is not a therapy session or a coaching or a counseling session. Okay, this is a pure academic learning purpose, uh, you know, anchored by an academic institution. So in the unfortunate event that some of you or anyone on this call 
uh, is having moderate to severe depression and planning to take uh, medical intervention or already taking medical intervention, please follow medical advice and treatment protocol. This session is not a substitute for the issues that you are facing. This is for people who are functioning normally, having some challenges every day. So they will be able to use those strategies. But if, this, if the significantly needle is on, on the other side, then you need uh, you know intervention that you have to follow. There are, I, I'm going to quote you a lot of published research that belong to respective owners. Uh, I have quoted them, I have given that as a reference under each slide. Some of the research I have also published that, that belongs to me. So I'll be able to show that also. And the views are personal. This does not belong to my company. So this disclaimer is out. So I'll quickly uh, you know, start into the first slide. So you, there is a person called Carly Tekas. Some of you might have heard of him. Most of you won't have Carly Tekas. Uh, he, he belongs to Hungary. He used to be in the Hungarian army in Budapest. And he was one of the best shooters they had. Okay, And he was an Olympic prospect. And in 1938, he loses his right hand uh, when a faulty grenade uh, went off in his hand, grenade blast. So he lost his right hand, which was his dominant hand. So both he lost his job in the army and also the Olympic prospect, medal prospect managed uh, with, his, with, with losing his hand. Then nobody heard of Carly Tuckers for the next two, three years. Uh, and 1941 or something that the Olympics was supposed to happen that was cancelled because of World War. Uh, so the, when the next Olympic was announced and they had this trial, trials or selection for Olympic team, uh, Carly Tuckers showed up for the selection. And most of the shooters who are going to go for Olympic uh, selection were all his colleagues because you get the best shooters in the armed forces, right? Army police. Uh, these are the people who do shooting for a living, unlike any other armed army. So, so most of his colleagues were very happy to see Carl, uh, Carly Tekas show up. And they said, we thank you so much for coming out of your home. We did not see you for the last two, three years. We are very glad that you came out of your home finally and you have come to cheer us. And we really appreciate it. So Carl Itaka said, no, 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 I have not come here to cheer you. I have come here to participate in the trials. So they were very surprised that, you know, you lost your right hand, which is a dominant hand. And we are talking Olympics here. We are not talking about some local tournament where the, the, the medal prospect is decided by like some few millimeters from bullseye. You know, that's what, you know, the gold, silver and bronze, there's really no difference between between them and you are, and you lost your hand and the people with the dominant hand are not able to win medal. How are you going to do it? So that is when he started shooting with his left hand. Okay, and this was quite a surprise for people and he sort of did well and he got selected for Olympics team, you know, to represent Hungary. So what happened when he went to Olympics? In 1948 Olympics where he participated, he won the gold in the shooting competition and he repeated that in 1952. So here is a guy who, who lost his hand. Many of us would have given up in, on, in life, right? But this guy came back those three years where he vanished. He practiced with his left hand. He bounced back from the crisis and he won gold. And we are talking, so the very best each country sends. So Karli Takas may be good in Hungary, but what about the rest of the countries who are participating? They send the very best shooter and this guy won the gold. So uh, so what happens in, whenever there is a trauma? Most of us are in this functioning. We are somewhere here. Some people are low on functioning always. They have chronic symptoms. You, you, mean you can't do much about that. Very, very rare you feel people doing extremely well. They are very, very rare. But generally, people are in this bucket. They, fun they have some medium level of functioning. And whenever there is an issue, when there is a trauma that happens, this trauma can be PTSD type of a post-war uh, stress uh, you know, syndrome or, uh, or any other uh, hurricane, uh, natural disasters. The, the, the stress level goes up and the resilience functioning keeps going down. And many of them just go there and stay there. They don't come back to the old way of functioning. Few people, handful of them kind of recover after passage of time and they come back to the old level of functioning. This is what you normally see. But there are extremely small percentage of Carly Tuckers that exist who after trauma grow. Okay, so there is a post-traumatic growth. So psychologists and other scientists are interested to know what causes people like Carly Tuckers to grow from crisis. They not only bounce back, they also grow. So this bucket is resilience. And this is what I want to tell you in the next few slides. What are the components of resilience? What are things which sort of hinders resilience? The thought process that hinders resilience and some strategies that you can use to uh, you know, get back, uh, get back to track some sort of resilience strategies and some published research I'm going to show and give you a way forward. Okay, so this is the chart. So quick definition of resilience, if you see, I want to focus on the red, what is marked red here for people on this call. 
So one is your ability to bounce back from crisis, that is resilience. And second is the ability to grow from crisis. These two are disjointed. These are not, not in the same continuum. So bounce back, uh, you know, is, you know it, it is not like a poor and a rich. If you don't have money, you are poor. If you have money, you are rich. This is not uh, that continuum. So lack of mental illness does, is not, does not mean that you are thriving life. So presence of mental illness and, lack, and absence of mental illness is one continuum. Absence of mental illness and you thriving in the life is next. It's not in the same plane. So there are two things to hear. One, there is a red to amber you have to move. The resilience is important for that. And the next thing is amber to green you have to move. That is where you grow. One, and, and the good thing is both these things, the engine for uh, getting from red to green, even though with the stop in between, is resilience. So what constitutes resilience is very important. This is a, a research by Professor Karin Revich. Uh, the book that I am recommending here is made by her. If it's good to buy and have, there is also last slide I have these books, and I'll send these books details to Professor and as well as Sudha Kargaru. You can get it from them. So there are multiples of papers published in top research journals, uh, academic journals, neuroscience journals, psychology journals, psychiatry journals, management journals in the world. These are top of the heap. They they all fall into these eight buckets. Okay, one is there is biology, there is gene related, genetics related. Some people are born resilient, okay? And this is something not everybody is blessed. There is a bit of genetic lottery here. So if you are not, it is okay because this constitutes around one third. Approximately people, there is between 30 and 40% I have seen. But generally scientists agree that one third is biology, which constitutes resilience. But there is two third in remaining seven buckets that you can do to build resilience for you. Okay, I'm going to give you one sentence given the paucity of time, what, what it means, even though this is intuitive, but you should know. Self-awareness is your ability to notice thought, okay, and then the emotion, then behavior. Okay, or, or, and also you should have a good understanding of your strengths. So that, that is important. It is metacognition, thinking about thinking. Okay, so if you are aware, then that is first step. Okay, the second one is self-regulation. Self-regulation is your ability to change the thought. Okay, ability to do, tone down the volume. You have to down-regulate the volume, that internal dialogue that is happening, that self-critic that is happening inside your head. Psychologists tell that there are about 60,000 thoughts in a day that any normal human being gets. 95% of them are repetitive thoughts. You keep saying the same thing and 80% of them are negative. So your ability to down-regulate, your ability to lower the volume is a very important skill that you can learn and build. The third one is mental agility. Mental agility is perspective taking. Your ability to look at multiple perspective uh, and for problem solving. It's a very important uh, indicator of good intellectual functioning. You are not a single trick pony. You are not going in one track. You are able to see various perspectives. If you are able to build that, it's an important contributor to resilience. The most important piece is optimism. In optimism, there are two types of optimism. One is forward looking. The world is good. People are good. Good things are going to happen to me. That is called disposition, uh, positional optimism. And next is how do you explain your past? That is explanatory optimism. I have one slide on optimism. I'll come to that later. The next piece of the puzzle is self-efficacy, which is mastery. Self-efficacy is your, you know, your, able, your belief in your ability to solve a problem. And that comes only when you have a track record of success. Okay, and this is not your pumped up, you know, you can rule the world type of uh, English uh, that is, uh, you know, useless at best and counterproductive at worst. Self-efficacy that you have several small wins. That is why the power of small wins you should never underestimate. Every small win adds to the kitty. It, it sort of rewires your brain. That is self-efficacy. The next one is resonant connection. Uh, you have at even one person you have, one person that you can lean on. Uh, connection and its connection is also one is related to human being next connection is uh, connecting to something larger than yourself uh, some people call it faith some people call it spirituality uh, it can even be a mission it can be a purpose it can even be an idea you standing in front of an imposing mountain or beautiful natural scenario so, and then you feel that you are part of something bigger so your ability to feel all that is very important and positive institutions is family work uh, community that you have, uh, which have, you know, there, there's not too much of a, uh, you know, more cohesion. It's not less cohesion and, and high on conflict. If you don't have any of that, then you'll be fine. These are core elements that build resilience. All the papers published in the world, okay, in topmost journals fall in these eight buckets, which uh, Professor Karin Revich has done. This is a source to her. The second is the world we live in. So most of you on this call, about 35, 40 people and those who are watching us on Facebook Live, would have seen this picture 
you know, in the past, this a lot of people tell us, this is the world we live in. And they probably got this wrong. Uh, because the world we live in uh, looks something like this. Okay. Uh, and this is the three pound, uh, you know, piece in, a bit, that is lying between six inches of our ears, uh, which is 2% of our body mass, but consumes 25% of the energy. Okay. About 1,500 cubic centimeter of processing power it has. And this is where we live 24 7. And this is where the, the thoughts that sort of uh, down regulates resilience, that sort of depletes resilience starts from here. What are some of the thoughts I'm going to show you next slide? Okay. And these are called, you know, uh, what is known as uh, cognitive distortion or thinking traps. There are many, many thinking traps. I would encourage you to Google and see them. But I'm going to give you the top eight that keeps coming again and again in literature. And I'm going to again spend one sentence on each of them. So you get an appreciation of it. And I'm, I'm going to give you this book recommendation that you can buy and read. This is a wonderful book. So first the uh, problem that we have cognitive distraction is mind reading. Okay. We think that we, we assume the other person who is hearing us and know what we are thinking and vice versa. We, we also think that uh, we know what they are thinking. And whenever we have this do this mind reading, it is usually negative. We think that the other person is thinking negative about us, ill about us. Okay, that create that completely breaks down communication. This is one cognitive distortion we have. The second is over generalization. We, we, one bad thing that happens, then we think that this is going to repeat again and again and again and ruin our life. It is it, there is no evidence that it ever happened before, but somehow this does not leave us at all. Okay, selective abstraction is also called mental filtering. So when an incident or situation happens, we only take the negative out of the situation and keep sort of thinking about it. We discount everything that positive that has happened to us. This is one cognitive distortion that, that again happens uh, in, in that uh, three pound mass. Okay, next is personalization trap, me trap. So here, if this is true, this happens more with women, personalization trap. Here the person thinks that, you know, I am solely responsible. The operative word is solely. Solely responsible for everything bad that is happening to me and to others. I am causing misery to others. This causes a lot of guilt and sadness. So if some of you on this call uh, are frequently sad or feeling guilty, probably you are having dominant in this type of a thinking trap. The next one is the opposite of that, which is a them trimping trap. You feel that the world is problem. Okay, you feel that other people are solely responsible for all the misery that you are going through. And this creates a lot of anger and aggression in you. So if people on this call that, you know, you have this kind of anger coming up, bubbling up, then you are probably operating from this thinking trap. The next one is helplessness. So here what happens is one negative event that happened to you, you feel that that is going to impact all other parts of your life. Okay, your personal life, your work life, your, your relationship with your kids, your spouse, uh, and you want to give up demotivated brain. This is helplessness. This is also a thinking trap. There is no evidence that ever happened before, but you keep ruminating. And this is the worst the next one. So whatever I have done in bold happens for uh, sort of depletes resilience more. This is not only bold, this is also red. Because this catastrophizing, that's quite a mouthful, or magnification is a thinking trap that a lot of us fall into. This is like wasting, you know, critical mental energy, ruminating. You think of, uh, you know, the worst case scenario that is going to happen as an outcome and you ruminate on and on and on uh, without even taking an action. This creates a lot of anxiety and agitation. So you overestimate uh, the, the problem or the threat when there is practically none exists and you underestimate the resources you have to cope with it. So this is catastrophizing. Since this is a very big thing, I'm going to have a slide next slide talking only about catastrophizing. And the last thinking trap is all or nothing. All or nothing is, it is also called black and white thinking. It is dichotomous thinking. So if I'm not state A and I got one B in a subject, then I, I'm a failure. Okay, if I'm not handsome, then I'm ugly. Uh, if I don't get a promotion, I'm worthless. So you are only this or that. Okay, and the world is hardly black or white. There's a lot of shades of gray and somehow you're not able to see it. Uh, there are a lot more. There are dozens more. This, this is a great book, about 700 pages. Buy this and read. This is a workbook. We can't lie on a bed and read this book. You have to work through it. So this is a good book to have. These are thinking traps. And I'm going to talk a little more about catastrophizing because this is what a lot of people have and which sort of depletes resilience quite a bit. You waste a lot of critical energy ruminating, imagining all the irrational worst case scenarios and then planning and not taking any action. So there are three types of catastrophizing. One is a downward spiral. You, you know, this happened, then, oh, this is going to happen, then I'm going to get fired, then I'm not going to be able to pay bills, people are going to come and take my house, 
So for nothing sort of you are gone up to losing the house. Okay, that is one way of downward spiral. Second is scatter shot. You are all over the place. Uh, this is going to happen. Then that guy is going to happen. That guy is going to walk out of me. So there is really no coherent thing. But you are all over the place. Circling is you are just two three places. You keep coming back. When this happens is when there is ambiguity, which is exactly the situation today. In after 2020, the world has become pretty much ambiguous. A lot of things are volatile. A lot of things are complex, uncertain. So this is the perfect time for catastrophizing to take over you. Okay, so and then with something high value at stake, job at stake, relationship at stake, you feel completely depleted. People are doing working jobs now. People are taking care of home. There are elders who need medical attention. People are completely drained and depleted. Okay, so that is another time this catastrophizing takes over and there's, and there's fear, fear of situation. It could be flying, it could be something as water, heights. So that again, this catastrophizing happens. So what are solutions? I'm going to give you some solutions. I'm cognizant of time. I'll stop in eight minutes. One is A, B, C, D, E. So uh, A, B, C is like activating event, which is a trigger. Okay, it can be anything. Somebody cutting in the traffic can be a trigger. What is the belief about the event? You feel that your rights have been violated. Okay, you don't think that, hey, this is just a matter of five seconds, I'll apply a break, that will pass. No, but somebody violated you. Okay, so if you are going to re reframe like that, okay, the emotional consequence is going to be anger. So people fly out of rage. Uh, you know, for just uh, some traffic, somebody cutting. So the incident seems to be small, but you are sort of took it as a as if somebody violated your rights, and that's why the reaction is that kind of a rage. So the uh, solution is to you have to dispute the thought immediately. Hey, this is just a five seconds, no big deal. Then you'll be fine. So how do you dispute the thought? I'm going to give you three strategies. Next slide. And then once you dispute the thought, you have to change it with some new belief. Okay. So what happens? Universally, people have found five places where this B and C connection. A is the trigger, B is the belief and C consequence. When you feel that people have violated your rights, then you, you get into extreme anger. Okay, so extreme anger is not because somebody cut the traffic, which is nothing. You feel that you violate, people have violated your rights. You walk in home and you see a dirty dish on the, on the sink. It is just a 15 minute to fix it. Okay, so you don't think that this is 15 minutes. You fly into rage and argue with your spouse. That is because you thought that somebody violated your rights and they didn't keep their side of the bargain. Okay, so you have to understand what is the B that you are working on. Okay, next is if there is a loss, even a loss of self-worth, not only real-world loss, there is sadness and depression. If you are continuously sad and depressed, your B is this. Okay, if you feel that you have violated another's right, suppose your team of three or four people, others have kept their bargain and you have not kept your side of bargain, you have slacked a bit, then there is a lot of guilt. You know, so that comes. The future threat, the boss sends a mail, let's meet after two o'clock. Then immediately, if you know, if your if future threat is your belief, then there's a lot of anxiety and fear. Boss would have called you just for a catch up. It may be even for appreciation. But your be your belief says that there is future threat, then you get into an anxiety or fear. If you compare yourself negatively to others, there's a lot of embarrassment. If none of this B really thinks uh, fits you, then there is something deeper, which is called iceberg beliefs. And usually it falls into three buckets. There is an achievement belief if you come from a family of achievers where your siblings have achieved a lot, parents are high achievers, then it is hardwired into you that you have to achieve, you cannot fail. Okay, then you are always under stress. Okay, if, then, then this is the underlying belief you have to sort of address. Or you could be an affiliation belief, you are very high need for acceptance. Okay, maybe you were abandoned as a child or not taken proper care of, a caregiver did not give that kind of attention, caregiver can be anybody. Okay, then this is the iceberg belief you have to address. Or it could be control and power. So these are something very deep. Uh, for more, you please read something, books on cognitive behavior therapy. Albert Ellis is the king in this, very closely followed by Aaron Beck. These are all top in the world. Okay, and, uh, and the next one is, I'm going to give you three solutions for real-time resilience. One is you bring evidence. Whenever you are going to ruminate some of the mental, uh, you know, I talk, talked about cognitive distortion. Whenever you are feeling you are in that mood, so immediately make, bring data, bring evidence. It has never happened in the past. Okay, so the, the starting sentence should be, that is not true because, because it has never happened in the past. Okay, 100 out of 100 times I have seen this, this has never happened. You have to make data vivid. You have to surface the vividness matters here. Another way to look at it is, you can use optimism in the moment, reframe it. Okay, a better way to see this is, okay, I did not clear this exam. Maybe I was not well prepared. Maybe the questions were difficult. Maybe I was a little misaligned here. I will come back strongly. Instead of saying that I am a failure, I will never going to do better in life. I have always failed. If this is the record that is in your mind. A better way to see this is reframe it. Okay, real-time resilience. The third one is 
when you are there is too much of catastrophic thinking happening so you can plan if x happens then i will do y instead of you know imagining all the irrational outcomes you have this kind of a if x happens i will do y so that is the solution next is having optimism so what happens is how do you explain something in the past that has happened bad for you okay some 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 situation did not go well if you are going to talk about it as you know i am the sole reason that has happened and this is going to stay with me forever and it is going to affect <clears throat> all areas of my life so that means you are in this personal permanent and pervasive mode of explanation if that is going to be your way of explanation that is where you have to dispute some of those thought the d and e connection i said because then you are going to be in the pessimistic pessimistic uh, area of the spectrum so if you are going to have this three piece as your explanatory style of something that has happened bad in the past you can dispute it positive emotions like awe like uh, inspiration like love like hope uh, like amusement uh, these things you know you can build uh, there are a lot of them available during the day if you start sort of observing them noticing them appreciating some of that that's happening it will broaden and build your psychological capital which is completely depleted so your psychological emotional capital will be will be able to build so once you broaden and build the thought action repertoire it will build the necessary psychological you know bandwidth that you hopefully need this is one and the next one is dose dose is an acronym which stands for dopamine oxytocin serotonin and endorphin these are neurotransmitters neurochemicals secreted in the brain so these are called uh, angel chemicals angel for a reason because they are god's gift for you naturally occurring so i'm going to bring it up the dope this is dopamine this is oxytocin serotonin and endorphin so uh, so this is feel good or reward chemical anticipation of reward brain pr produces a lot of dopamine it gives you happiness okay it's just anticipation of reward reward can be even a small goal uh, that you set up every day and then you achieve it dopamine is produced oxytocin is social recognition bonding if you are resonant connection you bond with people uh, you pet a dog or something like that you know oxytocin is produced uh, this is another kind of a bonding chemical uh, mood stabilizer is uh, uh, serotonin uh, happiness uh, that that comes when you are in outdoors working something outside sunlight you know out, not sitting inside the room and and, uh, and endorphins are pain reliever uh, if you exercise it's also called joggers high people who jog get a high end of the jogging that is that is endorphin getting released so it is dose dose occurs naturally uh, as a, if you lack any of the component of dose you know you you will have low self esteem motivation uh, mood swings you are stressed you feel lonely uh, you, there is a disconnect you are not able to sleep you have severe mood swings uh, ocd also sometimes uh, and then you sort of anxiety and depression and impulsive behavior the natural way to do it is you know have goal setting eat right exercise socialize little bit you know there is listening to music medic uh, meditation uh, having the right type of food exercise gives you this dose so i i, I know uh, I, i have published a paper on dose or your employee is getting daily dose of dose this is my paper that is published in international journal i published along with my professor murdula mishra she is also phd in psychology from banaras hindu university uh, this paper is a very small paper 1500 words that is the cap given by the journal that's not my cap i can't write one extra word so i'll send this across this author's copy complimentary copy i'll send it across through the organizers of this call please don't put this online then i'll be in trouble you can read it you can share it with your friends only request is this should not be seen online because this papers are sold by the journal uh, and if they find someone already give, put it online then then sort of they they then they can even sue us so i'm happy to give it very short while this is an academic journal but this is written for a corporate audience like yourself you will find this useful uh, that is my research this is a paper coming up this attachment is what is a paper i have written on dose uh, and the next one is character strengths so what are you when you are at your very best okay so when you are working at your very best your peaking performance what are the skills that are using if you want to find out there is a, there is a assessment tool i'm going to send this link also through the organizers it's about 240 questions just multiple choice questions don't fake it you if you take it seriously it will tell you the top 24 stents okay and if you are going to leverage the top 5 stents you will do fine in life that plus plus do you have resonant connection resonant connection the question that you have to ask is will you be there for me when things are going right not when things are going wrong will will you be there for me when things are going right if somebody is a spouse comes and tells you hey i got a promotion or whatever are you are you listening to the spouse you know actively 
uh, or you there is is there a eye contact or you nodding or you adding words of appreciation then that is the only way you build resonant connection there are three other ways you respond one is sort of you are distracted looking to the phone mumbling that, that that's a conversation killer or active distractor you tell what all things can go wrong now that you are promoted you will be working 15 hours a day you will not have time that is that is joy thief passive distractor is you know you sort of hijack the conversation you know what i also got something today and you don't even have the you hijack the conversation if you are going to be working in 2 3 and 4 passive distractor to this last three then you are you are not going to have any resonant connection this is the only way you build resonant connection what happens when you have both that is what happens when you are using your strength the top five strengths and building resonant connection this is something uh, i'll come to this later this is something that will happen you you uh, you attract there is something called positive emotional attractor this is a research done in the neuroscience labs of caseworks and university in the us professor richard boyasis and team you know when you work on positive emotional attractor whatever blue is there it's good or whatever orange is there that's bad so if you are not doing those two that i showed in the previous slide and your negative emotional attractor is peak which means there is something called hpa axis hypothalamus pituitary uh, and adrenaline axis sympathetic nervous system that kicks in so what happens it generates nor epinephrine nor epinephrine adrenaline uh, crh atch uh, crf uh, and finally cortisol these are all stress hormones needed for your survival so energy goes to the arms to fight if you need energy goes to the leg muscles to flee if you want okay fight or flight response that is needed energy is taken away from blood is taken away from all the other non essential things that time so digestive system practically shuts down etc so what happens here is that is needed for your survival but if you are going to operate only on that stress mode cortisol does two bad things to you one is switches off the t cell production in the body it switches off the um, you know uh, your immune system which is why people who are continuously stressed fall sick quickly you get cough you get cold those type of things because your immune system is shut shut down in 8 to 12 minutes if cortisol level goes up and second problem it does is it shuts down neurogenesis the manufacturing of new neurons goes off okay so that is the problem so acc is anterior cingular cortex so what happens here is you feel torn inside there is lot of guilt even this lights up when you are in the nea and and mps is medial prefrontal cortex so what happens here is you become very self conscious if you are socially awkward when you go into a party you feel very weird right this is where the things are lighting but when you get into the positive emotional attractor and if your ofc is which is orbital frontal cortex or neurus nucleus accumbens lights up that means you feel warm your parasympathetic nervous system takes up the body repairs is rebuild itself you know you feel very safe here so it is important that you work on your strengths uh, and identify strengths and work on them and 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 then have resonant connection the pea suppresses nea more of pea the nea goes on there's no time to explain this slide but this is good enough as a headline and the related concept that i have just one or two slides and i'll close but the, then there's a the relative concepts of uh, beyond resilience is thriving and flourishing this is where the the light moves from amber to green so so far what i talked to you to get you out of red to into amber so from the next subsequent concepts are not on this call maybe some other time we will discuss on how to move from amber to green so there are two important research perma model by professor martin seligman one of the foremost psychologists in the world uh, and, and then by professor felicia rupert and also savering so this moves into the green part of it the thriving part of it, the flourishing part of it. this is where you really take off there are some books i have given for uh, it's good to buy these books resilience factor by karin rivers most of my research revolves around the research she has done she is a, she was a student of professor martin seligman now she is a professor herself in university of pennsylvania philadelphia this is what houses warden school of business but these people are part of psychology department mood therapy by feeling good this is by david burns uh, he was a student of aaron beck the god of cbt cognitive behavior therapy these are the people who brought out this thinking traps flourished by martin seligman again is very very good positivity barbara fredrickson professor barbara fredrickson uh, professor in uh, unc university of north carolina at chapelville one of the foremost authorities on positivity this book is great meha chicks and meha professor again of psychology flow how do you attain a flow in life where the world stops around you you are so engrossed in the activity you are doing how do you reach that this is the book angela duckworth on grit angela duckworth was also a student of martin seligman and now she is a professor again in uh, upen uh, grit is uh, passion plus perseverance uh, 
so this is how do you build grit is there learned optimism again by professor martin seligman and savoring uh, there are some additional resources i, I have given you this is the uh, a link for identifying your key strengths i am going to send this through uh, professor uh, as well as sudhakar garu please do this this is free it is you have to just set up a uh, you know login password and then uh, the strengths comes to your uh, through email and this is my last slide okay uh, so why i came here and what i wanted to accomplish when mr sudhakar met me at my office and requested that i speak to you guys uh, on a topic contemporary topic of relevance i thought the most important topic today is resilience uh, especially in today's world and resilience is a foundation for recovery and growth moving from red to amber and amber to green if there is one thing which is common to both is resilience what are the components of resilience that i have shown you before and resilience can be learned it's only 30% genetics 70% you can still fix it and those seven other buckets i have shown you how you can you can use to build resilience and and this is a skill like all skill there is a learning curve initially it will look little fuzzy it looks little difficult but it will become second nature as you keep trying and and if that efforts the benefits that you reap from building this skill far far exceeds the efforts that is needed to build it okay and it is related to uh, thriving and flourishing this is known to be the single biggest factor in all round success professionally personally uh, resilience and you please look for how do you get daily dose of dose so if you do all that i have told you on this what our 30 minutes call certainly there is a very good chance that you may become a carly tech person next i i thank you for your patient hearing i am switching off and um, uh, slide sharing so that i can see some of you what do you say thank you very much sir thank you wonderful it's wonderful as usual uh, uh, this is much above my expectations uh, for a session like this uh, i thought uh, you will focus on one or two concepts but i think the entire canvas is presented this is a clinical uh, analysis of resilience the factors that trigger resilience and the aftermath of resilience how do we navigate and there are solutions so this this framework is very very useful uh, as much of academic depth as you as one would want it is provided and uh, so much of uh, application oriented uh, solutioning is is also addressed in your talk so thank you so much for this now what i will do is uh, for uh, uh, want of time we'll quickly get into the q and a without uh, too much of uh, summarizing we have two clusters of uh, q and a the first cluster will be taken up by professor prasad mm -hmm. and i'll come back for second cluster in the second cluster we will open the mic for the participants to directly talk to you okay. uh, so uh, so so we have roughly about uh, 15 minutes each for uh, these clusters i invite uh, professor prasad to start over to you professor yeah. thank you professor rao thank you dr mani for a, a very broad a uh, coverage of a very deep concept which as you rightly said is uh, one of the most uh, important thing for all of us today to understand this a bit better and to kind of uh, locate it within our what we see in our daily experiences i have a few questions yeah. of course i will be moving between individual and uh, organizational but one yeah. can always pick up from the organizational also yeah so here is the uh, first one now today we have all countries have to deal with this sort of a world Now, can you uh, give one or two countries, instances, leaders, uh, who which have responded better for national progress, and what did they do different from their previous approaches, which signify resilience? And how do you think they did it? Okay, okay. So again, it's a very deep question, but I'll try to answer given the paucity of time. I have a hard stop at seven thirty. This is a peak U.S. calling hour, but yeah, it's a very important question you ask, Professor. I can share experiences from my industry where I I work in IT tech industry. Uh, so how quickly we move, and there is also enough examples from the industry you represent also education. So what I am going to tell uh, IT is very 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 close to what education achieved in India. You ask for the country and the sector, uh, uh, India education or India IT, if you can take. So let me take education first, and then so that you will be able to connect uh, also. so when i visited uh, ifai your your school your university uh, in december for this part of amrit kal uh, exercise i was told by professors there when this covid shutdown happened okay they quickly switched the offline into an online mode okay with no loss of class they did not miss a single class was lost and they quickly moved it was new for professors it was new new for students 
uh, and how quickly and that is where the resilience is the resilience is with how quickly you bounce back from a crisis your own institution is an example and this country has witnessed so if i had to take my my uh, industry we lost significant amount of people you know in my own company we lost hundreds of people to covid many of these guys uh, were healthy individuals young as 1800 itself is young uh, age wise okay and these are people with no habits no prior comorbid known comorbid condition exist a lot of people lost a lot of stuff you see people not not alive and or some people lost uh, entire family i know a colleague of mine who she lost her father mother and husband four people were in the house three of them were no more uh, of course there was a grieving period and she came back and started working uh, and we move the world you know indian it is if i have to little bit uh, modesty if i set aside uh, pretty much the top 2000 global corporation in the world is run by some or someone or other in india in the indian it crowd so if there is a magic switch and we switch off the server in india all the servers the world is stops spinning on its axis uh, you know even though it's slightly exaggerated for effect but that is what it is but quickly they moved you know banking customers healthcare customers highly regulated environment and they allowed people to work from login from home because that is used to be a significant security uh, issue if if you're not logging from your odcs in office logging from the home through odcs and all that how quickly we sort of moved into the online to mode from an offline mode three years and also supporting people taking care of their hospitalization we converted our uh, all our uh, guest houses into hospital as a quarantine center you know people if they don't want to uh, quarantine themselves now there are six or seven people one person is affected the one it may affect others so the person quarantines itself in our guest house so multiple areas taking care of people travel medical bills and without losing a single day of work for our customers you can't afford also was a excellent example of a resilient company organization also people so answer your question which country which sector i would say india education and, and it thank you dr mani i think uh, we have a better glimpse there of uh, something very specific which has happened in the past now let me take you to something which is very present we have you know byju's in a very hostile environment paytm is also in a very hostile environment yeah so if you know uh, you need to advise the leadership yes. there uh, what kind of resilience would you suggest okay see many i i know what is published uh, okay uh, but there could be so many things not published uh, that would have happened where these guys would have missed so if i say what is published and what is the noise that we keep hearing uh, somehow somewhere byjus did not take care of his people okay so the increments were not given a lot of people were let go uh, but they they signed up uh, celebrities like messi to uh, so spending millions of dollars and you saying no money to pay you somewhere there is a huge disconnect uh, you know that happened with byju's i mean this is completely uh, what do you say very far away from the action so what as a as a person observer who has read about it not knowing the nuances inside i, I can tell you on that some of kill the company it is only people so just to quote byju's and paytm i will tell you about a personal experience that i have gone through in a company which bounced back satyam computers okay so while i'm part of techmindra now actually i joined satyam computers uh, you know I, I, i was an employee of satyam computers when this issue happened when this uh, fraud allegation hit uh, the company and lot of people's uh, customers were worried Uh, you know the, the business was going away from satyam computers but the people were very real so i know what happened inside uh, the, the the employees were very real the customers were very real and and the new management took over the government took over they appointed a board uh, you know deepak parekh and team and and, and they they sort of found, found a buyer for a lot of people bid for it and finally tech mahindra won the bid so what happened in those 3 4 months of limbo is people took it personally since satyam computers but for that one incident took very good care of employees okay it was known for a people friendly policies a very friendly company extremely good in terms of treating people uh, across age gender and things like that very women friendly organization etc etc uh, and when customers said you know we are not sure of a delivery people went berserk in the positive manner they sort of did not go home they slogged and they did it so when uh, the government appointed board ask the customers how is the delivery now so many many customers said if the delivery was very good earlier it is outstanding now it is almost that people 
want to prove a point. So, uh, so Baiju's Paytm and Satyam were pretty much thinking, okay, how come one organization bounced back so good because the, it was the employees who felt that this company is real, maybe two, three people, whatever. We don't know the situation might, might have stayed, but we have to prove to the world that we are real. So if people were treated nicely, they pay back 10x when it matters. Excellent, excellent. I think there's a very excellent value, uh, value point there for practice by all leaders who are on this uh, call. Take care of your people and when you have adversity, they will take care of you. Okay, I think uh, we are at uh, 7.17 and uh, you mentioned something about 7.30. So I'll hand it yeah, back yeah. to Professor Rao. It's, it's if time peak, permits, yeah, I'll come know, back. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, we are discussing an extremely relevant point today. And this is applicable to all walks of life, not just professional work, not just entrepreneurial uh, journeys, but also personal life uh, as important as sports, and as uh, interestingly as politics, for example, if there is a party that is in power and it looks too big, then the opposition cannot come back. So, so I think resilience of all kinds is extremely applicable. So we will dedicate the remaining time completely to taking questions from the audience uh, so that uh, 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 we allow them to talk more and you can respond to them. I'll yeah. request a I'll request, uh, couple of people to do that. Uh, but while, while they are opening their mic, uh, I will also mention, sir, that research says resilience is something anthropologically man, and when I say man, humans are wired to bounce back, create some difficulties, natural, man-made, they overcome that. We are wired actually to overcome. And therefore, if people are actually not overcoming uh, when they are facing adversity, there mm -hmm. must be a few hurdles and challenges in the ecosystem, in the society that we live. And your framework definitely addresses those uh, challenges to be removed. Uh, when personal willingness to change yeah. is dominating the other things, I'm sure it is there. It's like a patient who would like to recover yeah. will be more prone to recovering faster than yeah. someone who is not willing to. So that willingness has to be there. Uh, so the my friends who are raising hands, please go for the question. Thank you, Dr. Bunny, for giving me the time. And uh, Dr. Sudhakar, sir, and... Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, Dr. Prasad, sir, I mean, thank you. I mean, thank you. So you talk about, uh, talk about the dose, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, serotonin, and... Uh, endorphins. Endorphins. Endorphin. How do we, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, like, it's very easy to tell it to yourself. But when you need to talk about somebody else, I mean, it's like when you need to enlarge somebody of your teammate, I mean, it's like you, you somehow you feel weak in the needs. How do we? How do we? I mean, rather, for that matter. Yeah, so scientifically, this can be done, uh, Baskar. Okay. okay, and see, as I told you that these are all not theoretical concepts. These are all, see, when, when there is a resilience questionnaire, that, that, uh, that link that you will get it sometime. Okay. Uh, to professors. See, these are all administered to 85,000 people, 200,000 people. These are not some 30 people, 40 people sample size. So what has happened is, so power of small small wins. That's why I spoke, I, mean, I mean, rushed through. I don't know whether you heard, caught that point. There is something called Progress Principle. There is a book called Progress Principle by a professor. Uh, professor Sir, I've written, I've written all your books. I mean, like, I'm going to buy you all these books. I mean, no, no, I'm just saying, there is a book called Progress Principle. I have not listed it here. Okay. I'm answering the question. There's a by Professor Teresa of Harvard Business School. Professor okay. Teresa is a PhD from Stanford, and she is now last 40 years working in Harvard Business School. And she has found out, and she and her team, she means these people have large teams, large budget, large funding agencies, billions of dollars. So what they have found across culture is power of small wins. Any small win. Suppose you have a target, you achieve, you made a good presentation, the boss said, hey, well done. Your customer said, I like that. I like the visit, you know, you guys satisfied, your spouse is appreciating, your team member is saying, I sort of, you inspired me here, anything. You don't have to go win Nobel Prize. Okay, uh, the small wins, it sets in motion, okay, a different type of force multiplier inside you. It rewires your brain. So if you look at the brain chemistry, and the last 20 years, significant amount of research has happened in neuroscience and, 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 and all these domains are coming together. Okay, so there are about 100 billion neurons in our, in our brains, 100 billion. And when you do that, the trillion, trillion, trillion connections they make inside, okay? And we are pretty much uh, electrical pulse, 
and neurotransmitters. That is all. Human beings too. Okay, the neurotransmitters that uh, that uh, the neurons don't connect them. So there's a small gap between neurons, which is called synapse, and that is where the neurotransmitters are released. Okay, so how quickly is your electrical pulse go, and what parts of brains are lit up, uh, and, and what types of neurotransmitters are generated is going to design uh, decide your ability to bounce back, your mood, uh, your optimism, everything. So a small win triggers that type of a force in you. And there is a saying called neurons that fire together, wire together. If they start firing together, they start wiring together. The strength of the wiring connection decides how... I got you... it, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think I no, no, go, oh, no, no. I, somewhere your question said this is kind of theoretical how to do it. So I was trying to tell you oh, how to I... do theoretical. <laughs> The significant amount of research that has gone in. That was what I wanted to explain. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Great. Next question, please. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anil Kumar, uh, would you like to take your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so good evening, Dr. Mani. Um, I'm not sure if you would recognize me by my name, but I'm one of those people who has the privilege to be your associate. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, it, it's very nice meeting you here again. Heard you so many times. Impressed her every time as much. <laughs> so, quick thing, um, I, I want to just uh, pick on a couple of things. One, which probably is a continuation to what um, Mr. Vaskar also was talking about. And I want to draw some a couple of things from my personal experience and share here. Yeah. Uh, may not be a question exactly, but uh, from an academic point of view, you could help me relate how my experiences are, are, are you know, really relevant. Uh, one thing is, as you rightly said, the, the Satyam episode, yeah. where I think we've, we've all, I mean, we've spoken enough about it. Yeah. But in the recent past, there's something um, I've been, uh, you know, very closely experiencing. One of my close relatives, he had a brain stroke and he's mm -hmm. going therapy and recovering. Mm -hmm. So the kind of, um, uh, you know, things that we have been told as to how to behave with him, how to work with him, how to help him recover and how mm -hmm. the brain actually functions with respect to, again, coming back to the point that you just mentioned, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the wire together, right? Yeah. So, uh, they, so there are uh, you know, uh, interventions that we as people around the person can make, yeah. which will actually, you know, help. This is, I mean, while we've heard a lot about what we say is group healing, yeah. I, I'm personally, knock on wood, seeing it work. Yeah. So I think the the production of dopamine and uh, while, while probably uh, artificially providing is one thing, yeah. generating that and in fact, uh, just yesterday, he opened his eyes for the first time in like 45 days and he wow. was looking at us. And the only thing that doctor said is at his age of 75 years, if he has been able to do it, it's only yeah. because of the positivity that you guys are around him. Absolutely. Right? So, so I think uh, one, something that is very much relating to what you just said. So I think his resilience has increased because of the presence of all of us around him who are continuously supporting him and... Uh, Yes, yeah, the yeah. number one factor is resonant connection. He was fortunate to have you guys. Okay, these connections are resonant. You started giving him positive reinforcement that, you know, even lifting the hand, yeah. uh, you'll say, very good, you are now able to hear us. See, that you first they'll ask, are you able to hear me? That's what doctors say. Uh, if yes, not, they nod. Right. Okay, if you are able to hear me, they sometimes may tie the hand because, you know, they tend to pull out the right. thing if they are in the ICU. Then they'll say, lift the leg. They lift the leg. So then you say, this is amazing because it's really amazing. And, you know, those type of small, small things, then they'll be able to sit up on their own. Uh, they may be able to walk two steps with, with support, not on their own. Everything you have reinforced positively. He was lucky to have you guys. And in like, fact, uh, sorry, not intending to interact, but, uh, you know, when we took him to the hospital, the doctor said he has two to three hours if you want us to operate. Otherwise, we will lose him. Yeah. And from there, in 45 days, we he is in a place today where he opened his eyes and he was responding to us yeah. I mean, even we were related <laughs> yeah yeah so so just to if you have to just give this karin revis you know uh, template mm. uh, there are eight things you know one is positive institution good family okay next is resonant connection third is optimism you started plugging with a lot of optimism so you will find all this fall into these eight buckets genetics minus the so seven buckets yeah. Again and again. Yeah, I, I was very much able to relate to that, and that's why I was. Thank you. Uh, this is a very. I, I wanted to be you know, silent today. <laughs> yeah, you know, you shared a very personal thing. Of course, you know, thank you, Mr. personally, thank you. no, thank you and much. it was sort of resonates with the topic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Mr. Srinivas now taking the question? Otherwise, uh, uh, sir, uh, how is India staying ahead of other Western countries, so to say, 
in a in an extremely recessional kind of a situation that is how are, how how is india coming out of that or what are your suggestions for india to come out oh this is again a very deep question sir uh, and many many a times you know uh, what we are trying to do right now as a as a overall country is perfectly aligned to you know you know one is getting the youth uh, fired up okay and second is saying that you know self reliance important is not only government job and you know has set up something on your own uh, atmanirbhar is another thing you know self sufficiency uh, let us be independent of other money that is another thing getting into a lot of this you know uh, renewable energy clean energy is an area of my research interest also uh, you know we can power the entire country with this offshore wind energy putting turbines in the sea excellent, excellent. so harnessing those things so that you are not dependent on import or oil those many many things we are doing right many many things as a country it it needs a separate session by itself i know i know excellent these are very very big topics i want to also right. acknowledge the fact that we are joined by some very distinguished individuals from different different domains namely yeah. uh, education training uh, yeah. armed forces yeah. uh, health care people yes. have joined from all the apart from it and apart from entrepreneurship yes. these are the significant sectors that i see who yeah. have uh, joined thank you so yeah. much sir and uh, professor prasad would you like to uh, at least share a question uh, or shall we conclude i think we are at 728 back to you i respect the hard stop time i think uh, we are moving back from uh, yellow to red so <laughs> that's the kind of thing therefore we are rushing i want to place on record uh, our uh, appreciation and gratitude to you sir i think you are an amazing speaker i think you need two hours not just one hour <laughs> uh, but uh, today we have understood how we can look at resilience resilience has been a theoretical concept although everyone is reeling under the impact of resilient uh, lack of resilience but the way you have approached has given us lot of uh, food for thought we need to go through that link and take that test and yeah. probably uh, bucket ourselves into different situations and see how one can help ourselves come out of uh, these things using resilience skills resilience skills is needed much more now than ever before as you have mentioned yeah. with various examples i think we are all wired we are all capable of coming out of this 70% is you know through your will power and your ability to master it through yeah. various initiatives that you have suggested and only yeah. 30% is through genetic that is through nature yeah. and by nurture about 70% it is yeah. amazing uh, all out of the several books that you mentioned i read only two books that is uh, the flow of mihai cheeks yeah. mihai yeah. and uh, the other one is great but other books are there there is a lot to study and learn your own personal example is uh, you are a lifelong learner and that's a huge motivation for all of us we need to keep on learning we need to keep on uh, not just acquiring degrees but i think making productive use of those uh, knowledge uh, seeking uh, ventures that you have uh, focused on so many courses that you have learned thank you so much sir for your presence and your valuable time uh, we are ever thankful to you kindly uh, email your uh, ppt so that we'll attempt uh, a summary ppt has lot of appropriate thing i'll mention all the links i'll give you separate you, you can give it the yes. links and books and other additional courses they can do i'll give it the ppt fantastic. has some other data as you see yeah. fantastic thank yeah. you so much sir Thank, yeah, thank you thank you sir thank you for having me thank you sir good evening thank you. amazing amazing yeah. so ladies and gentlemen we have just had uh, a wonderful talk uh, sir uh, your 730 is there you can leave yeah, i can I sure. appreciate that friends uh, uh, this is a very very big topic as we have understood and uh, we have tried to complete it by 730 pm given the paucity of time uh, the questions that you raised are quite pertinent and very very relevant and uh, uh some of the questions are already addressed by uh, the speaker in his initial remarks through the ppt and uh, a few questions which are outside have been taken up and uh, in spite of this if you still have some uh, naughty issues or uh, or certain discussions that you would like to do please again write to us we will share this with uh, uh with dr mani and we can get an email response and probably we'll share it with you this is something which we have to focus on continuously and not just in a continuum of uh, uh, of 60 minutes uh, nothing can ever be learned only in 60 minutes but 60 minutes can trigger you uh, towards lifelong learning and that's what we have been trying to do over several sessions 139 today uh, i think one session is not enough one focus area is not enough one leader is not enough i think to lead this life peacefully and productively to be very very uh, useful and productive in our work and to make a good sense of ourselves and become a leader and help others i think we need to continuously learn by listening to these experts 
listening to these leaders and then craft our own methods to excelling, craft our own methods to leading our organizations, our enterprises, so on and so forth. I think in real life, many people who have participated have, uh, have written to us saying that it is extremely useful. And I'm sure every single session is very, very different. Uh, every single topic is different and uh, the issues are dealt with in a greater detail. Therefore, it can be taken back and used in our own context, in our own domains. I'm sure today's session also is like that. You will go back and use it in the situations that you will address. I think, as I mentioned, clinical analysis of resilience, the anatomy of resilience itself has been provided by Dr. Mani. We should be able to use all that to figure out where we stand and what are the issues that are triggering uh, these, uh, these anxiety, these fears and things like that. And therefore the solutions that are provided in terms of ABCD, I think that's a very easy way of remembering everything. So uh, sure, this is going to be very, very useful. Although there's a disclaimer saying that it is not a medical therapy that one is providing, but definitely this is a session which will help us improve our psychological capital, our bandwidth and making ourselves uh, uh, very, very productive. I think that is the much needed session. We are extremely thankful to Dr. Mani as much as we are thankful to you for your wonderful questions uh, that you have raised. I request uh, Professor uh, Prasad to say a word or two and then we'll wrap it up. I think we owe it to our next generation to display a certain level of uh, resilience within ourselves. Every opportunity, every challenge we come across gives us that sort of a learning. And the most important thing is that we do it ourselves. And if others see us doing it, I think the others learn. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. We have realized that uh, one person who has asked the question, Mr. Anil Kumar, is also our student who is pursuing online MBA. Very good. Although these sessions are not specifically designed for our uh, students, uh, some of the students are senior. They, they pursue online MBA and they come back for it. We are very happy that he, he Mr. Anil Kumar has raised this question. Thank you so much. Uh, next week on uh, 8th of March, we are going to have yet another speaker, amazingly well-known to all of you. Uh, he is Mr. J. Sai Deepak. And uh, Sai is, a, is an advocate of Supreme Court of India. He is going to talk about uh, the litigation landscape. What are the challenges? And he's going to focus on the practitioner's point of view on litigation in India. I think uh, it is going to be very, very important given the uh, possibility of uh, talking about some cases and uh, how one can navigate, build careers, and at least we can get a ringside view of uh, how litigation is being practiced in India and how we are affected indirectly uh, while some very, very, uh, very, very thoughtful and uh, expert uh, uh, litigators are engaged in such litigations. So see you next week uh, at 6.30 p.m. March 8th. Till then, read all these books on resilience. It is about bouncing back and also growing from there on. Wish you all the best and see you uh, next week. Good night.